All right, so this morning we are going to just do a conclusion of the pre-trip rapture uh, by going back and looking at everything we've looked at over the last five weeks. It's going to be kind of a whirlwind. This is none of this, only the last few slides is actually going to be new stuff, uh, the last couple of slides. But I thought it would be good to just wrap it up with, you know, one summary so you can put all the pieces together about the doctrine of the rapture. Now, what's important to understand here is that there is a lot more out there that we could have looked at. We literally, I, I spent a semester in seminary studying this one aspect, okay? So we could have really spent another two months here. There's so many verses that allude to things, that are clues to these things, but I felt that it's not time worthy to look at clues of possibilities, and that's the reason why we hit on the pretty obvious stuff, and that's what we're gonna look at today, is a review of the obvious stuff. But before um, we go there, and I wanted, because I wanted to make sure I have this, so I put this, I'm gonna start putting this at the beginning so I, I don't forget at the end. Uh, this week, Revelation 5, I really need you to read these. These are five chapters. Okay, Revelation 5 and the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is four chapters. It's very small. But the book of Ruth goes hand in hand with Revelation 5. And when you read it, you probably were going to ask the question, I don't understand why the book of Ruth goes hand in hand with Revelation 5. You, you will understand next week. I'll just put it that way. Um, and it all has to do with the kinsman redeemer. The goel is what is known in the Hebrew. And we will study the goel. <laughs> that is the reason why you need to read the book of Ruth. Okay, it won't take you that long. Read Revelation 5 in the book of Ruth. All right, so the rapture of the church. We first started off by looking at criticisms of the rapture of the church. That the word rapture is not in the Bible. And so a lot of times, and I have been in more than a dozen discussions. I can't even count the number of times. And I, as I explained earlier, I have actually made a, a document, because I've, I've had so many of these discussions, I've actually just decided several a couple of years ago it would be easier to create a document <laughs> and then copy-paste every time I had the discussion rather than retype the whole thing over and over and over again. So, because I've had this discussion with so many people, and most of them, some of them, they're, they're Christians, but they're either they're, they're Catholics, or they're of other Protestant denominations who do not understand the rapture of the church. And their main criticism is the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, that's true and false. Uh, but we learned that we do have doctrines that aren't in the Bible. The words aren't. We have the doctrine of the Trinity is the most prominent one. The, the word Trinity it never appears in the Bible, but yet we believe it. And all of that, and I always use this because every one of those people, you know, putting this argument forward that the word is not about. I, I, first thing I say is, do you believe in the Trinity? Can you show me in the Bible where the word Trinity is? Well, it's the same thing. In a roundabout way, the word rapture is in the Bible. It is found in the Scripture, but it's a transliteration, just like the word Jesus. The word Jesus is not found in the Greek New Testament. And as I explained when we first started this, that if you were walking the streets and, and you know, 2,000 years ago and saw Jesus walking along and teaching, if you'd have yelled out Jesus, he would have known who you were talking about because he's God, but nobody else would have known. All right? His name is not Jesus. His name is Yeshua, which is Jesus in the Latin, which is a transliteration into Jesus in, the, in English. Same thing works for the word the rapture. It's found in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to spend time on these verses. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, you should know it. It literally means to be caught up, and the Greek word is harpazo. And in the Latin Vulgate, the Greek word harpazo is translated repumur. Repumur. And that is transliterated into the English rapture. This is exactly what happens with the name of Jesus. You see it 
And one thing in the Greek, the Latin transliterates it, and then the English transliterates the Latin. Okay? So it's an Anglic Anglic anglicized word for rapture. Okay. Now, real quick, Christian can't speak today. Eschatological views. Remember, we have the preterists. That is fulfilled in the first century. That's that they say everything that's in the Book of Revelation is is already partially and fully fulfilled in the first century before 70 A.D. We have historicism, which shows that okay, we're going to fulfill this over the history of the church. We have idealism, which means that everything in there is symbolic. And we have futurism. And that's where we fall in, is futurists. Futurists uh, break down into amillennials and postmillennials. Amillennialists believe that there is no literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth. Postmillennialists believe that the, the literal reign of Christ on earth is real, but it happens after the thousand years. Both of these predominant were predominant views for the first 1900 years of church history. And there was an event that we talked about that blew these out of the waters. Anybody remember what it was? When people had to really go back to the drawing board on prophecy. What was the event that occurred? And it was really a, a, a lengthy event over several years. It occurred at the beginning, early last century, 20th century. World War One. It was after World War One that... Church theologians, Protestant evangelical theologians, started to really look and go, you know what? The world is just getting worse and worse. There ain't no way we're ever going to get so good that we usher in a, a thousand year millennial. Right? So, because that was what they said. We were eventually going to evangelize the world. The, the world would get better and better and more peaceful and more peaceful until we got so peaceful that Jesus would come back to a conquered world for him. World War I blew that out of the, out of the water. Pre mills that movement believe that the uh, return of Christ comes before the millennial reign, and they, they fall into we have the pre trib, the mid trib, the pre rapt, and the post trib. Those are your different rapture views. And we put it like this. Let me go back. Put it like that. So from the cross, we have an unlink, unknown length of time. Then we have the start of the tribulation, the signing of the treaty. We have the decimate, uh, abomination called of uh, desolation. Then we have the second coming of Christ, and we have the thousand years. And when we break that down into the raptures, this is how it looks. Pre-trib rapture believes it happens at the start, or could be before. And it really could be an unlinked unknown length of time before. It could be the day before, it could be the hour before, or it could be years before. We don't know. It's a silent thing in the scripture. Looking at the way things unfold, I don't think it's too long of a period of time. It could be several months. Then we have the pre wrath view, the <coughs> mid trib view, which are pretty much the same, and the post trib view. One view that we're going to look at at the end of today's lesson is the partial rapture theory, which ought to scare every Christian. It scares me. We'll, we'll get to that. So, then we went to uh, disproving the post-trib rapture. <clears throat> Why is the post-trib rapture certainly the false view? I, as I've said several times, I'm about 90% pre-trib. I'm about 10% pre-wrath in the middle of the tribulation somewhere. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. What I will be dogmatic about is the post-trib. Uh, I'm pretty dogmatic about that. And there's several... These are just five of the main reasons, but there are a whole lot of other reasons. <coughs> yeah, especially when you account, when you look at the pre-trib rapture. Uh, first of all is, can you do simple math? Because the book of Daniel tells us specifically, there will be this many number of days, from the abomination of desolation till the second coming of Christ. If you can do simple math, then Jesus' second coming is not a mystery. It's not hidden. Okay, uh, He can't come as a thief if you know he's coming on a Tuesday. Right? Population problem. Remember, uh, the post-trib view is another, another word for the post-trib view. I call it the great yo-yo effect. You go up, we come down. That's basically what would happen. Uh, raptured up, meet the Lord in the air, and come right back down. 
That's called a yo-yo. Or just a yo. I don't know. So, so what has what's the problem with that is there's several problems. First of all, where's the Bema seat? Where's the marriage supper of the Lamb? And as we looked at the, the Hebrew, the, the Jewish wedding, which we'll, we'll look at here in a little bit, where does all of that take place? Now, granted, with God, time is, you know, we understand time can be, you know, and it could be, in a man's view, uh, you know, 20 seconds. And in God's time, we might have thought we were there 50 years. Okay? I understand those. But the real problem is the population problem. Because if everybody who is a believer in Christ is raptured and then we come down and it's immediate judgment, who goes into the millennial kingdom? Because the Lord is very clear that the people are separated from sheep and goats. And it's also very clear that we have living, breathing people re-inhabiting re the world and repopulating the world during the millennial kingdom. We see it in Isaiah. Remember Isaiah said there will no longer be a, a, a man, you know, an infant who, whose days are a hundred years. And the person who lives to be a hundred will be thought a curse. In other words, if you only make it to a hundred, then you're not living right. Where do those people come from? If everybody's raptured, we put on immortal bodies, and then we come right back down and everybody else that's left behind is judged. There's a population problem. There Are there workarounds to that? Yeah. But this is, to me, a totality of evidence. And number three is the Noah and Lot problem. We see in Matthew 24 and in Luke where they say, you know, as in the days of Noah, as in the days of Lot. Well, what happened in the days of Noah? Everybody was just going along, eating and drinking, marrying. It was life as normal. Everything was kosher. It was cool. They were living life. And then sudden destruction, boom, in one day it started raining. The, the, the gates of the deep opened up. If it's post-trib, then everything from Revelation 6 on has to be a lie. Because when you, have, when you read the book of Revelation, you saw that does not sound like life as usual on the earth. When a quarter of mankind are dying here and a third of mankind are dying here and people are hiding in rocks and caves... Because, you know, the wrath of God is upon them and there's a demon locusts flying around stinging people who don't have the mark of God and people are begging for death and can't find it. Does that sound like days of Noah when everybody's just living hunky-dory? No. Does that sound like everybody's rocking it hard like they were in the days of Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah and we're just having a good old time? No. It can't be the same. To me, this is my most prominent right here. Because you can't find a way to make the last three and a half years of the tribulation look anywhere normal. It is, it is hell on earth. In these days, it was not hell on earth. They had no clue anything bad was coming. I guarantee you the people who are living in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, they know something's bad coming. Okay. When you're hiding out in a cave and you're wanting rocks to fall on you and kill you because it's just so bad, you're not eating and drinking and giving in marriage. Jewish problem. What do you do with the Jews who have been promised, according to Daniel 9, that they've got to say in bringing about everlasting righteousness? And then as we looked at last week, or week before last, you've got a restrainer problem. Who's the restrainer? And the Antichrist can't be revealed until he's taken out of the way. So, three interpretations of John 14. Uh, we looked at this next. Uh, the, the, remember John 14 said, In my Father's house are many mansions. And I'm telling you right now, I'm going to prepare a place for you so that I will come again and receive you myself so that where I am, you will be also. That's John 14 in a nutshell. So, we have the three interpretations. That it's one, at the time of the believer's death. That it's two, talking about the rapture. and that it's Or that it's three, talking about both. Well, we know that the answer is certainly not just number one. Okay? Um, because of what we're going to look at next, which is the Jewish wedding. We know that it certainly includes number two because of the Jewish wedding in Matthew 25. Remember, none of these scriptures are isolated. That's where people get into error. 
is they take them isolated and they don't look in the context. Remember what we have to do when we study the scripture. Original language. We've got to get rid of our traditions and our thoughts. We've got to look at the original language and got to look at the context of the hearer. What if, when they're hearing about this, what are they thinking? So I leave the possibility out that it's probably, it could be, it's, it's both of them. It's a, it's a fulfillment of, hey, I'm going to come back and receive you when you die. But it's totally fulfilled at the rapture of the church. So, we learned about the Jewish wedding. You cannot understand John 14 and Matthew 25 unless you know the details. And when, when Jesus said, I, I come and I take you to my Father's house, every Jew that was there understood exactly what he was saying. If you do not understand the context, and this is where people fall into error with that first interpretation, well, that's just talking about Jesus coming back. No, because what you're failing to do is understand that when he spoke this, he was talking about a Jewish wedding. Okay? And that has nothing, Jewish weddings have nothing to do with people dying. All right? It would have been extremely misleading for Jesus to give these references and illustrations of a Jewish wedding and them knowing it, and then it mean nothing okay. and related to that. That's deception. And we know that's not what Jesus is. Okay? So, the Jewish way. We have the selection of the bride. That's the betrothal process. Then we have the arrangement of the redemption price. In the context of Jesus, what was the redemption price? Blood. The blood. You have been redeemed. You have been bought, which is what happened. The bride was bought with a price. What was the price? The blood. Right. There was the offering of the marriage contract. There was consent of the bride. They drank from the cup and they sealed the engagement. So this is how it went down. The bride received gifts from the bridegroom. Their gifts are salvation. The washing of the bride. Now then the bridegroom leaves. He goes away. And he goes and prepares a place. He, he, he built on a little... A, a little side house on his father's house. Read John 14 again. That's exactly what he's saying he's going to do. And again, it's extremely deceptive of Jesus if, they, if it has nothing to do with this. All right. Then the bridegroom returns. It was usually at night with a shout and an unknown time. They didn't know. They had to keep watch. The brides, the virgins, they had to keep watch. Her, her, her wedding party would keep watch for her. And when he was a far way off, he would shout. And it was usually at midnight. There was a great song by the Gaither Vocal Band called The Midnight Cry. Um, awesome song. And I'll, I'll try to play it for you next week. Uh, and then they would take a processional back to the father's house. They would lift her up. They would have torches and lamps. And then there was a consummation. And then the marriage supper. And the marriage supper lasted seven days. There's seven again. Seven, seven, seven. Always, everywhere, sevens. And this is another reason why we think it's a pre-trip rapture. Because it's seven years, it's seven days of the marriage supper. Now, could God have spiritualized that somehow? Sure. But I just don't see God working that way. Because, you know, it was the Lord through Paul that said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. All right? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said that too. Just, you know, don't say this. Don't say it. Just, if, if Jesus said, if you, if you mean yes, say yes. If you mean no, say no. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, we look at Daniel 9.24, which said, 70 weeks are decreed for your people. And your people meant specifically a tribe, a nation, a... a and it didn't mean just, ooh, everybody in a big catch-all. It was specific. For the holy city, Jerusalem, to fin and here's what we're looking at, is to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, the cross. Then, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal the vision and the prophet, and to anoint the most holy place, the second time. And notice who it's decreed to. It's, it's not decreed to the church. 
And we don't see anywhere in the scripture, and certainly in the book of Revelation, where the church usurps that authority. There's a theological term for that. Does anybody know it? It's something theology. You know it offhand? It starts with an R. It's called replacement theology. Replacement theology, if you ever hear that term, replacement theology is especially espoused by the Roman Catholic Church that the church superseded because of the rejection. They basically, all the promises to the Jews are broken. But what they forget is, is that Genesis 12 is an unconditional covenant. It's not a conditional covenant. It's unconditional. And unconditional covenants mean you don't have to keep up your end of the bargain, but I will keep up mine. And so there's, there's history. Re, there's, history is replete with examples of the devil trying to get God to break his covenant to the Jews. That's why Hitler was there. That's why the Spanish Inquisition happened. The diaspora. All of these things, the Romans attacking and, and sacking the city in 70 and 71 AD, all of those things are, are Satan trying to nullify the covenant so he can prove God a liar. Okay? So Daniel's 70th week. We talked about what a week was. That uh, literally means a period of sevens. And we see that it's broken down into a seven, seven weeks, 62 seven weeks, and then there's this other one that's out there. And so we talked about a Hebrew year being 360 days. And so that first period was 49 years long. The second period was 434 years long. And when we and that final period is just one week. It's, it's seven years. And when we total that up, we see that we've got uh, 69 weeks or 483 years. And it was from event to event. The first event was that Cyrus would say, go rebuild the city. On that day, and we know when that happened. On March 14th, 445 BC, we know that day. That's when he said, go do it. And that began that first period of seven years. And that was completed 49 years later when they finally got everything done. And it concludes with period two, which is... 1,700, I'm sorry, 173,880 days later to the day when Jesus was cut off, when he was, he walked in, declared himself, and was rejected. Okay? So, the most accurate prophecy provable in the scripture, bar none. Because it's mathematically provable. And if, I, if you recall, that the, the reason why the book of Daniel is the most contested book in the Bible is because it is so accurate with prophecies that the skeptics, even liberal theologians, have to say there is no way that this could have been written by Daniel because no one could be that accurate because supernatural stuff doesn't exist. And some of them have even gone as far as to say that uh, it had to be written in the first century AD, which we absolutely know is a false, it's, 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 it's a lie. Mm -hmm. We know it is because it's included in the Septuagint, which we have historically know was done in the 3rd century B.C. We, we know for a fact that it was done then. We have every record, but they will have to they ignore that to their own peril. So, and that's Palm Sunday. And we heard that we read that cut off was basically the death sentence of a criminal. So we look at the last week. We look at we're going to look even more at Revelation seven four in the coming weeks. And basically, at the last seven years, the Jews in charge of spreading the gospel. That's what it. That's what it comes mm -hmm. down to. Seventy weeks are determined for thy people to bring an end to all of this stuff. Not us, not the church, not Gentiles, thy people. And we remember in the context, if you would have told Daniel, your people, who would he have thought you were talking about? Jews. Because he had no clue about church age and there's, you know, people grafted into the, the root and, you know, what we see in Romans 11. So, 
getting into the pre-trib rapture, we looked at Revelation 4.1. And we, he, we see this come up here, and I will show you. And the voice sounded like a trumpet. And so we see this, a voice like a trumpet. Is that possibly an allusion to 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4? And we also see that the other time, the only other time that this Greek combination is used is in Revelation 11. And we'll look at that again in the next few weeks. Uh, when the, the martyrs, the, the, the two witnesses, they hear a voice. And it says, come up. It's the same phrase. It's the only time it's used. And it's in 4.1 and in, it's in Revelation 11. Come up hither. And what happens to those two res uh, I just told you. <laughs> They're resurrected. Those two witnesses are resurrected. They then put on glorified bodies. Everybody sees it. And everybody sees it, which is an illustration. In John's mind, he had no clue why he, he, he couldn't possibly understand why he was writing what he was writing, where everybody in the world is watching their dead bodies at the same time. Can I throw in something? Sure. I heard last week that they put cameras at the holy place, and I thought, Dan and I thought together, okay, yeah. here it is. This is the usher in yeah. because now every eye can see it. That's right. CNN, CNBC, That's right. all that, right? Now we can watch it, right? And they give, they, they, they well, I don't want to, yes. No, 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 that's, that's exactly right. Uh, but I was about to go even further than I want to. I don't have to wait, I've got to save some of the fire for later. And then we look at this group in Revelation 4, these 24 elders. And we notice that they're elders, which means that they could either be elder in age or elder in spirit. We've got to remember that Timothy was a young man, but he was an elder. All right? Uh, they're seated on thrones. They have some white garments on them. Uh, they have golden crowns. They perform a priestly service. And when we looked at that, we realized that that is all the promises in the book of Revelation. To the first, the chapters 2 and chapter 3, to the church. And so, therefore, if it's, the, if, you know, because Jesus said, I'm going to give you crowns. Or you're going to be seated on me with my Father's throne. I'm going to give you raiment of white. You know, these are these are clues that this group of 24 is representative of the church because the only time we see the church from Revelation 4 on is possibly when we see the 24 elders. We, we hear nothing but the church, the church, the church, the church. All throughout those first three chapters. And then it's, they're gone. They're, they're disappeared. That's... Where'd they, go? Where'd they go? They came up hither. <laughs> All right. So then we'll look at uh, we looked at Second Thessalonians. We talked about here the restrainer, uh, and we heard. Remember what the Thessalonians were worried about. They thought that they had missed it. Some somebody had snuck in and said, "Hey, you know the day of the Lord's already here. You know that they, they, you know the Lord." We're already in the great day of the Lord, the tribulation, because persecution had started stepping up. So the Thessalonians are freaking out. They're like, wait, hold on. We missed it. Paul told us that all this stuff would happen, and if, if we're here, then why is Granny's body still in the grave, and why am I still here and not been translated? Because remember what he told them in 1 Thessalonians, and he also told them in person. We have no idea. I wouldn't you just love to be a fly on the wall to hear what he sat there and told them? You know, that would have been some great teaching. So he told them all these things because he tells them later on, he goes, remember what I told you when I was there with you. So it, not only did he say it in 1 Thessalonians, he told it to them in person. And he's like, guys, you know, apparently whoever was spreading this rumor was really convincing because it had them all freaked out. Now, I would say that if if you saw events going on and you were totally sold on the pre-trib rapture, which like I said, I leave the door open for several things, but if I was all in on the pre-trib rapture and so dogmatic about it and there was absolutely no way that I could be wrong, and if I saw the Antichrist signing a treaty who, and then going in and declaring himself God, I'd be freaking out too. Like, wow, 
But I think I'd have smarts enough to go, okay, well, I missed my theology. See, they had something that we didn't have. They had access to the Apostle Paul who actually wrote the letter. And he had told them specifically, this is the order of events. And he said, remember, you're not, because what they were saying was that Nero was the Antichrist. The Antichrist is there. He's here. His name's Nero. And Paul is like, no. Remember, I told you. You can't have the, you don't know who the Antichrist is going to be until there's this falling away first. And the restrainer's removed. And he's not. So they thought they'd missed the rapture. And he said, don't let anybody deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless there's a rebellion first. And we saw that rebellion, rebellion means apostasia. It means literally a falling away. But that the first seven English translations say it's a departure. And interestingly, that word apostasia, see, this is where we have to be careful. This is another instance of us making our own tradition about a word mean, what a word means and not going back to the source. Because if I tell a, a hundred preachers what does apostasy mean, every one of them would mean a departure from the faith. Oh, that's a departure from the faith. That's apostasy. That's a heresy. It's not to a Greek. Not to a Greek in the first century. They had no con concept of their Greek word meaning all that means you're going to depart from some kind of a religious faith. No, it doesn't. It just means you're leaving. It, 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 you, you would basically say, I'm going to apostasy. I'll see you when I get home. Or when you get home. Or I'll see you next week. Apostasy, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm departing. That's, way, that's the word. So we have to be real careful when we look at our, just like the word agape. We have taken that and we call these things logical, they're logical fallacies, um, but they're, they're, they're also just other fallacies, they're scriptural fallacies, because we have equated these words. So we have to be real careful. Uh, so it can really, it can remain, mean a departure from the faith in the context, or it can mean a literal departure of people. And again, in the context of the day, if, if you weren't in the church, there would have been, you know, a whole bunch of people would say, we're going to apostasy. And they would have all thought, okay, well, they're leaving. They're going somewhere. They're departing. They're, they're getting out of here. So we have to be real careful about the Greek words we need to look at. And that the man of lawlessness is going to be revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself. So that day, the day of the Lord, and this is another thing that uh, post-trib rapture people get wrong. They want to say, and I'm sure David's seen it all too many times, they want to say that that day, they do not understand that the day means a period of time. They want to say it's a literal 24-hour day. So basically, the day of the Lord is supposed to happen on one literal 24-hour day, and all of these things apparently happen in one 24-hour period. That's just not possible. All right. The day of the Lord, if you look in the Old Testament, it's always it's a, it's a period, acceptable day of the Lord. When Jesus says it's acceptable day of the Lord, how long has it been so far? 2,000 years? That's a pretty long day. So all you have to do is look in Scripture and realize that there are other meanings for, you know, instead of being so literal. All right? The, exactly. Yeah. So the day of the Lord is preceded by the departure. We talked about that. The revealing of the Antichrist. And he is revealed fully. In other words, there ain't no, there ain't no denying when this dude is, who this dude is when he walks into the temple and says, I'm God. Worship me. And then Brother Nelson, uh, what uh, Brother David said is 48. Well, uh, I, I forget who it was. Paul or somebody said, uh, uh, that Generation Jesus, pass. Jesus in Matthew 24 yes, said, you know, when you see the fig tree buddy, yeah, uh, yeah that generation shall not pass and all these things are fulfilled. Israel becomes a nation among nations again. Yeah. Well, that na <coughs> generation shall not pass. Right. And we're going to talk about that as we look into some prophecies of Zechariah chapter 12, um, especially with what's going on now. No, I'm ready for that. Yeah. More likely, uh, the Holy Spirit is a restrainer. And there's the scriptures that we talked about. Again, these will be in the class notes. 
so the Antichrist cannot be revealed until there's a falling away and the restrainer is taken out of the way. And we believe the restrainer is the Holy Spirit in, in the body of the church. So finally, we get to the final possibility. So this is the new stuff. The partial rapture theory. So I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if the Holy Spirit is the one who moves people, and there's going to be a great harvest, and the Jews are going to be given 144,000, mm -hmm. and if the Holy Spirit's taken out, then how is that supposed to happen? Okay, because what happens is, what's theorized is the Holy Spirit begins his ministry as a, what he ministered in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You, uh, you still have salvation through Christ and belief in Christ and faith in Christ, and we know that in Revelation. But what we see that, remember, the Holy Spirit ministered individually, rather in the collection of the church. That's the theory. And that's what it's a devious or person. Right. So, evangelists. Uh, yeah. They're a virgin. Yeah. They're a male. Right. And there's 144,000 of them. They're God. That's it. That's it. Right. So, um, so we look at the partial rapture theory. This, the theory here is, is that you may be a Christian, but you may be left behind. Now, I know this is new to most of you, but I'm going to put it out there as a real possibility. Do I think it's what's happened? I don't know. But I'm going to prove to you that you cannot automatically say, no, it's not. All right? This is one of those things that's like, hmm. Because we, we see that the promises to the church in, Re, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, only Philadelphia is promised to be removed. You have six other churches who are given promises and told to do this and you'll do this, you'll overcome. Only Philadelphia, not even Smyrna, only Philadelphia is said, I will keep you from the hour of tribulation. And if we remember our... Our diagram here for the first few weeks of class, remember that we get this switch with who, who has an ear, let him hear, and then the promise. Remember it flipped, and what we said was that was showing that you would have these type of churches going through to the 70th week of Daniel. Well, if you look at what God tells them, what Jesus tells them, he tells the church of Thyatira, which will still be here at the tribulation. He says, Behold, I will throw you in a sick bed, and those who commit adultery I will throw into great tribulation. Sardis, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come against you. And then uh, Laodicea, those who I love I reprove and discipline. But to Philadelphia, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. There is no other promises, and these are churches. And we know that they're, you know, all of them but Laodicea have a commendation. Well, Sardis didn't. But Thyatira did have a commendation. And we're told that they're churches. And, and you know, they're, they qualify as the church even though they're doing some really rotten things. And they're told, if you do not turn around, I'm throwing you into a sick bed. I'm going to cast you into great tribulation. You're not going to know when I'm coming. And I'm going to discipline you. Only Philadelphia. Is promised. And then we get into Matthew 25, the ten virgins. We have five wives' virgins. Now, in the in a, what did Paul say? I'm, what did Paul said that Jesus says, I'm coming to present you a chaste virgin, right? Remember? Okay. So we have five wives and five foolish virgins. Five foolish have no oil. In other words, an oil always represents the Holy Spirit in the scripture. So they are not filled with the Spirit of God. They have some. They have no excess, though. They, they, they had some in their... In their Breakfast! Uh... Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry, guys. I oh, don't worry about it. No, don't but worry about it. Here, here's the good news is they're really nice and homemade. And well, homemade. let's break it out. And I'll let me finish this up. Okay. So, the, the, remember the bridegroom delayed. He, 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 he didn't come back when they thought. And so five of the very, every, every, well, actually all of them slept. It didn't say just the good ones slept or the bad ones slept. They all slept. But at the midnight cry, they needed to, remember that was part of the, the marriage procession, is they would light the lamps because, see, the bridegroom's coming at midnight. 
They had to light their lamps. They had to light lamps. Well, and it's sometimes a long walk back to the bridegroom's dad's house. So some of these, these five virgins, they had lamps, but not for a long walk. They were going to run out. And they were like, hey, let's bump some, can I bump some oil off of you? And the five, vir the five good virgins were like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you go buy some. And so they went out to, at the last minute to go prep, to go buy. In other words, this is a last minute thing. <laughs> Nope. Walmart wasn't open. No. Walmart was not open. It was not a super center. <laughs> and so the wise virgins are taken to the wedding feast and the foolish virgins are left behind because they were not prepared. Right. All right? So, finally, we'll look at this. Luke chapter 21. Watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. I think of like, it's a trap from Star Wars. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> or it will come upon, who's it going to come upon? All who dwell on the earth. But stay awake. Does this sound like the virgins? Does this sound like what, what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25? Mm -hmm. Stay awake at all times praying that you may have strength to escape. So if you're asleep and you're not praying, you, you're still one of, you're staring on this group, but you don't have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place. And when you escape, where are you? You're standing before the Son of Man. And where's the Son of Man standing? He's in heaven. So. And Nelson? Yes, sir. You got the sheep and the goats. You got the wheat and the tares. You do. You got it. You, many will cry, Lord, Lord, you've got to ignore an awful lot of the Bible to not think that the way you live your life is that's going right. to determine That's right. Choice. So I'm not going to say that dogmatically that there is a partial rapture, but I'm going to say this. I wouldn't be dogmatic on that. No, I'm not going to be dogmatic on it. But what I would say is you have to have another pretty good explanation for ten virgins because other, it's not five virgins and five gals that acting like virgins that ain't. All right? The illustration is not five virgins and five hookers. Right. All right? <laughs> it, it's a Pretending to be virgins. Yeah, there's too much separation. Exactly. So how, how You've got you ten virgins. Ten saved virgins. Ten saved virgins. They're all virgins. They're all virgins, but only five of them get into the seven-day seven marriage supper. Right. So what about the... Uh, Illusion makes no sense that you believe the lie. We're going to talk about that later. Right. We'll talk about that when we get to Revelation go, 13. Further we go, the more of this kind of stuff you're going to hear. That's right. That's why I write it all. Yeah. Uh, so, cool. we we don't. I know. The, the key here is. I'm sorry, but i got to go to my next class. Yeah, we got a class. we got to get going. You're not going to have a class. 